All right. Well, hey, good morning, Gateway. Come on in. Come on in. Find a seat. We are so glad that you're here. If you're watching online, we are glad that you're joining us as well. I'm excited to worship the Lord together this morning. Uh, it's going to be a great, great morning, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. But first, I want to give a special welcome uh, to our guests. Any guests that we have with us today, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. We are glad to have you worshiping with us. Um, we'd love to get to know you a little bit, and maybe the easiest way for that to happen is if you're a guest and you want to grab one of these Connect cards, they're sitting on the ends of the rows uh, here in this room, or you can go to the website that's above my head um, if you're watching online or if you're doing to do the online thing instead, and, and you just let us know a little bit about yourself, um, and you can ask any questions that you want, things like that, and we would love to be able to follow up with you. So go ahead and like I said, fill out one of those cards or, or go to the website um, and, and just let us know a little bit about yourself and we'd be thrilled to, to follow up with you. Uh, I'm excited to worship this morning uh, because we got something extra special. I can't think of a better way to kick off a worship service than with a baptism. So, so I'm going to invite somebody up. Uh, so I'm going to invite up Kellen uh, Arnold and, and Leland is going to come up as well. Uh, Kellen comes this morning uh, wanting to, to take that step of baptism. Is that, that He's been a believer for a while but has never taken that step of baptism and said, you know what, it, it's time and it's something that I need to do. So we're excited uh, for him to take that step this morning. For those of you who may not know, Kellen uh, and his wife Michaela, they've been attending here at Gateway for about six months. So it came in about August. Um, they've got cr three kids, Reed and Ryland and Rory. Um, fantastic family. And so I'd encourage you uh, at the end of the service today, if you get the chance, introduce yourselves, uh, you say hi. Um, I know that, that they would love to, to get to know you a little bit, but um, we're excited to, to be a part of this. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and, and kick things off. I'm going to pray for you. Um, while I'm praying, they're going to go ahead and get in position, and then I'm going to shut up and get out of the way. Um, but before we do that, I do want to mention one thing real, real quick, is that when, whenever we have a baptism, anytime we have um, something like this happening in our service, we want to celebrate it like the incredible thing that it is. And so I want to just remind everybody, when he comes up out of the water, we want to celebrate. We want to jump to our feet and hoot and holler like somebody is coming out of the grave, because that is exactly what is symbolized in baptism. Um, so, so I want you to be ready for that. Uh, Kellen, we're going to go ahead and pray for you, uh, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to you guys and do your thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for, for Kellen and for Michaela and their family. God, thank you for the commitment they've made to, to raise their family to know you. And, and God, thank you for, for Kellen and, and his faith in particular to come this morning and to say, you know what, God commands us to be baptized, and, and I want to take that step. I want to identify myself with him through the waters of baptism. God, it's such an exciting thing to see someone take that step in their faith, and so we want to celebrate that this morning. Thank you so much, um, more than anything, though, for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, who makes things like this meaningful. The, the, the baptism would have no meaning without Jesus, and, and so it's because of him that we celebrate this morning, and we thank you so much uh, for your spirit and the way that, that you've been moving in, in Kellen's life, Father. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Kellen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here with you and excited for this. But before we do that, I got just a couple questions for you. Uh, the first one being, uh, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. And have you taken him as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. All right, well, it's because of your confession of faith that I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's you got to if you want them. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing this morning. And we got a lot to celebrate. Congrats, Callan. Jesus, mighty King of heaven, Thou, O Lord, our guide shall be. Thy commission we rely on. We will follow none but Thee. 
as an emblem of thy passion and thy victory o'er the grave we who know thy great salvation are baptized now beneath the wave so fall on us oh of the world despising we the ancient path pursue we're buried with our lord and rising to a life divinely new so fall on us oh Captives of thy blessed grace and offering our lives hereafter, and we resolve to seek thy face, and we resolve to seek thy face, we resolve to seek thy face. We resolve to seek thy face. Yeah, we resolve to seek thy face. Fall on us, O oh, Holy Lord. Our hearts, O oh King, are only yours. And by It's your breath 
One of the marvels of modern technology is how it allows us to receive information and communicate with each other almost instantly. We can get things like the weather report in real time, allowing us to decide what jacket we're going to wear for the day, or even if we'll wear one at all. Applications like MapQuest and Waze use traffic algorithms, giving us the quickest route to and from work with an estimated time of arrival. We can order lunch and have it delivered to the door or make dinner reservations. We can pay our bills sending money directly from our bank accounts to the vendor without writing a check. And we can order almost anything online and have it delivered right to our doorstep. We can do our grocery shopping for a pickup drive-by without getting out of the car. And we can search YouTube and receive instant instruction on how to do any number of tasks around the house, whether preparing meals, 
or doing car repair. We can watch news stories and sporting events from around the world as they're happening in real time. And if you're a subscriber of Verizon, they'll even record and send you your usage report, breaking down which apps you use daily and for how long, further exploiting our fixation on instant information. If you're like me, watching the news is no longer limited to the 6 p.m. news hour. I feel compelled to be in the know, and I check favorite news feeds whenever I want throughout the day. One obvious downside of this is the constant exposure and turmoil and tragedy that characterizes much of our world. If we're not vigilant, these sights day after day can take a spiritual toll on us, causing anxiety and depression. They can cause us to forget that, as Paul wrote, we live by faith, not by sight. Jesus told us in this world, we will have trouble. And in today's world, I think that's an obvious conclusion I don't think any of us would argue with. It's what Jesus said before and after that statement that make, makes it so noteworthy. Before it, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And after it, he said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. On the night Jesus made this statement, a special kind of trouble awaited him, and he knew exactly what it was, his arrest and eventual death by crucifixion. On that same night, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples. In just a few hours, it would look as if Jesus had been overcome, that his voice and his influence had been erased. But three days later, that voice and that influence returned in resurrection power. Ask yourself, what is it about life in this world that tends to make you feel overcome? For all of us, that answer will vary from person to person, and you probably likely have more than one answer. For each of us, personal circumstances or situations involving family or friend, friends or, or maybe just ourselves can take a toll and can weigh us down. These variables just illustrate the trouble that accompanies life in this world. But here's the real deal. Jesus contrasted life in this world and gave us a way out, a peace that, it, that can only be received through him. Communion offers us the opportunity to remember that. Well, we must live in this troubled world. We have chosen to live in Jesus in a kingdom, not of this world. As we take communion together, let us also, as Jesus said, take heart. The overcomer has made each of us overcomers. Let us pray. Father, we love you. And we will never forget what you've done for us. Father, remind us that whatever this world throws at us, that you're bigger and we can find our peace in you. Father, we ask that uh, we're able to examine our hearts, examine our lives, our thoughts and our actions, and live in a way that represents you and honors your sacrifice and allows others to see who you are through us. We ask these things in your son's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the men move forward to pass out the elements, I ask that you hold on to them, and I'll come back and we'll take them together.
The Apostle Paul encouraged believers in Corinth this way, For I received from the Lord what I have passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is a time in our service when we remind our members um, about offering. However, if you're a gift with, or if you're a guest with us today, uh, please don't feel any financial obligation um, uh, to to contribute to our to our church. However, uh, if you'd like to, there is an offering plate in the back, and you can do that on your way out today. Or if you'd like to contribute online, you can do that as well on the address on the monitors. Let us pray, Father. We love you. We thank you for all the blessings that that you give us. Father, we ask that we, we use these offerings in a way that further your kingdom. We ask these things in your son's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, good morning again. Uh, it has been an exciting morning already, um, and I'm excited um, to, to introduce someone to you uh, to, to just continue some of the great things going on. Um, so I want to introduce, this is Tyler Snow. Tyler Snow is with an organization called World Compassion Network. Uh, World Compassion Network is an organization that we have supported for a church financially uh, for quite a while, uh, but he's here for a special reason, and we'll get to that. But first, I wanted to just introduce him and say, Tyler, you know, can you just tell us a little bit about World Compassion Network, who, who you guys are, what you do? Uh, yeah, just give us a little bit of an overview. Yeah, uh, good morning, Gateway. My name is Tyler Snow. Uh, and I'm the Disaster Relief Coordinator at World Compassion Network. Um, at WCN, we have three main branches of work that we do. Uh, the first being uh, local community involvement and outreach, so a lot of um, giving back to our community, helping with food pantries, homeless shelters. Uh, the second one is uh, Honduras. We have a missions director, Josh Grill, who you guys probably know. Um, who does work in Honduras, uh, building houses, church planting, mission trips. Uh, and the third one, and uh, our largest branch, would be disaster relief. So um, that's my job, basically, where I go to disasters to help clean up and just spread the gospel. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? When you go, when you go somewhere and you do disaster, disaster relief, like on the ground, what does that look like? What are the different forms that that, that takes when you go somewhere? Yeah, so disasters um, obviously are very different depending on uh, the actual disaster that happens, uh, but the response is largely the same. Uh, our main goal in disaster relief, uh, the very first thing we do is connect with a local church that's in and around the disaster area. Uh, and that way, everything that we do is through the local church. Uh, we're there to support and encourage because long after WCN leaves, uh, that church is still there spreading the gospel. So we try to direct everybody to the local church um, and just come alongside them to support them. And ways we do that uh, is through uh, food distribution. Sometimes we'll set up these big hubs um, where as supplies come in, we'll collect them, organize them, and then be able to distribute them to victims that need it. Uh, some days it's just sun up to sundown physical labor. Uh, we'll go into houses and clean out houses. So if there's a flood, uh, we may rip out all the drywall, the carpet, take everything out of the home before all the mold and mildew sets in. Um, sometimes it's food distribution where we will uh, set up with a local partner with some tents and music and stuff and we'll cook food all day and uh, just pray with people, listen to people, cry with people. Um, so that's kind of generally what it looks like, just looking at how can we best meet the needs of the local church to help support uh, what they're doing in that community. Awesome. 
So that's awesome. I love that you guys do that. Uh, and it's actually something that they've done here recently. When we had a tra- or the tornado that came through Clarksville um, back in December, World Compassion Network, they brought down um, several disaster boxes, which we'll talk a little bit more in a second here about what that is. But th- you guys brought down like 100, 120 um, of these boxes uh, that were then given out to people in the community who'd been affected by the storm. And so this is something that y- this, this disaster relief work that they do, we've seen it benefit our own community right here. Um, and actually, we're going to be starting something this month um, that I'll have Tyler tell you a little bit more about, something that is going to be going on all month long that is just kind of right along in those same veins. So you may have noticed when you came in today, there's a bunch of boxes piled up over here along with a display for World Compassion Network. And so, uh, Tyler, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what are those all about? What, what are we doing um, over, over the next month or so here at Gateway? Yeah, so our, our family to family box program is nothing, uh, it's not a new concept, but we're heading in a new direction with it. Um, if you have been here for a while, you probably remember we used to do this box program and we would send them to Honduras. Um, and we've recently retired that program because it's a lot of oversight and financial uh, issues trying to get that through customs and through thievery down in Honduras. And um, so we've tried to shift gears to figure out how can we best do this to get to the people that need it. And so what we've come up with is two boxes. Uh, there's two different, it's the same box, but two different things will go in the boxes. Uh, one of them is a disaster box. And basically the concept is pretty easy. All you do is you, you spend $20 to buy a box. And that covers the Bible we're going to put in it, the box itself, and then all the shipping and handling it takes to get it here, get it back to a warehouse wrapped up, and then take into a disaster site. And then once you have that box, we have two separate shipping lists. Uh, or packing lists, um, and they're all over on the table. And basically what you do is you take it to your local store, fill it up with the contents that are listed inside, and then uh, we basically get all that packaged up back at our warehouse, and then I take it to disasters wherever I go. Um, And to you guys, it may seem just like a simple box full of uh, trash bags, gloves, stuff like that. Um, But what a lot of people don't realize is when disasters happen, Uh, It quite literally is just the clothes you have on your back that some people end up with. Uh, They have, they don't have any money, they don't have any home, they have no car, no food. And so this box is quite literally a lifeline physically for them. Um, And so our big push at World Compassion is to be able to create these boxes that not only meet a physical need, but also a spiritual need. And that's our main focus. The box itself is great and what's in it, and it does help physically. But it's much more than that to us. It's all about um, what that box represents and how we can show Christ and his love through through giving those boxes. So uh, the entire month of April, I think, we're going to be collecting boxes here at Gateway. Um, Like I said, just $20 for the box, and then you fill it up, bring it back, and then I'll come down in about a month and pick everything up with a trailer. Um, And then those boxes will be sent all over the U.S., uh, where I'll be directly handing those to people that are in need of those. Um, so it's a really cool opportunity. We encourage you to pray over the box as you get it, um, because again, that's that's our main focus um, is the, the the spiritual part of this. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a great program. It's something that you know, if you've got kids, it's something you can do together as a family uh, to kind of involve everybody and and kind of speak to them a little bit about what World Compassion Network is doing, and then more importantly, why they're doing it to to share the love of Christ with people, to, to have compassion on them. The way that he did. And so, like he mentioned, we're going to be collecting these all month long. As a, as a church, we have a goal to fill 100 boxes. Um, and so we're going to be just piling them up, piling them up over there uh, all month long, and, and it's going to be an exciting thing. So I'd encourage you, um, as, we, as we wrap up service today, um, take a minute, stop by World Compassion's table, talk to Tyler, grab a box, uh, ask some questions, and, and let's see what God does this month. I'm excited about it. So that being said, Tyler, let me pray for you. Let me pray for World Compassion Network, uh, and then we'll jump into what we're doing for the rest of the morning. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for, for Tyler and, and for the work that he does with World Compassion Network. Um, God, thank you so much for, for that organization and, and their faithfulness to you and, and their heart for people who have been affected by, by disasters. And God, it, it being in a community where that recently happened here, we know the impact um, that it has when, when people are able to be there in that, that time of difficulty and, and to providing things for people that sometimes in the moment they don't even realize that they even need yet. And so thank you so much 
um, for this ministry and, and everything that they do. And so, Father, we just pray that, that as we collect boxes this month, that you would guide us as a church to, to get involved in any way that we can. And, and for the people that will be receiving those boxes eventually, uh, God, we pray that they would know your love um, because of, uh, of the, the things that, that World Compassion Network is doing and that we're able to come alongside them as a church to help with as well. God, thank you so much. Um, more than anything, though, for Jesus. Thank you for your love and your grace that moves us with compassion to do things like this. Uh, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thanks. Thank Tyler for being here. Thanks. All right. I am excited this morning to jump into a brand new series. Um, but before we even get there, I've got to ask a question. Anybody else in here hate to be told what to do? Like you just, you just don't like that. That's me. Um, if you don't have your hand in the air, you're lying. Um, like that's it, something that is inside all of us. So we, we all have that in us where we just don't really enjoy being told what to do. And it's so common, there's actually a term for it. It's called psychological reactance. And, and basically, it's the idea that, that your brain has a response to anything that it perceives to be as a threat to your freedom. And, and what that reaction is, is it tends to produce feelings of anger and hostility and aggression. And that can be a really, really good thing. Like that's something we want in our lives. It, we should be upset when somebody wants to place like major limits on me or on someone else that, that should not be there, that are, that are wrong to be there. We want to have that reaction. But the problem is, is that on the other side of that, a lot of times that reaction tends to pop up in response to some really minor things too. See, even things like receiving a command or a suggestion or sometimes even a question, a request, can sometimes feel to us like it's a threat to our freedom. And so this is why you can be on a diet, and, and your spouse can know that about you, but you want to have a little bit of a cheat day, and, and they can come to you and be like, oh, aren't you on a diet? And something stirs up inside you immediately. You're like, what, where, do they, like where do they get off telling me something like that? Like, how dare you tell me what to do? Even though it was a goal that I was working towards, and you maybe are just trying to help me like stick to that goal, there's something in us that just like, mm, I don't like that. Or, or maybe it's something different. Maybe you're at home, and the dishwasher needs emptied, and you know the dishwasher needs empty, and you're actually planning to do it until somebody says, when are you going to empty the dishwasher? And then, like that, then you just think the nerve of some people. Like, like all of a sudden, you're upset, and your reaction to something you were planning to do anyways is now all of a sudden, no, I'm, I'm not going to. And, and we know this, too, is that some people react a lot bigger to this type of stuff than others. But if we're honest with ourselves, none of us likes to be told what to do. And the advertising world has figured this out. In fact, they have this down so well that the advertising world has learned how to get you to do what they want you to do. They'll get you to buy their stuff by making you think that it's your idea. They, they, don't, they don't tell you to buy their stuff because you wouldn't fall for that. But they get you to do what they want anyways. No, Nike has a famous slogan, it's, it, it's not just buy it right? It's just do it. And the idea is that you have freedom to do what you want, so just do it. And that's how they sell their shoes. Or maybe the best example of this is Burger King. Burger King has a, had a slogan for over 40 years called have it your way, right? Like that was the thing with Burger King was that at Burger King, you had the ultimate freedom to get your food just the way you want it, but only at Burger King. Only at their restaurant did you have this incredible freedom. And it was a really effective slogan for over 40 years. Burger King knew how to appeal to our desire for freedom and autonomy. And see, we all think that maximum freedom is exactly what that slogan is. It, maximum freedom is when someone says to us, you can have it your way. Or maybe when we say to ourselves, I want it my way. Or maybe we say it like this, and this is a statement that we're going to continue to come back to several times throughout this new series that we're starting today. We say to ourselves, I want to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want. 
Like that was probably, that was probably your anthem as a teenager, right? Like that was, that was a thing that was constantly on repeat with your parents. It was like, no, I want to do what I want, what I want, when, with whom I want, and you can't stop me. Like, but as you got older, you met some people who actually lived that way, and you saw the damage that it caused in your life. But yet the idea still sounded really good. And so most of us, we just add this little tagline on the end. We say, I want to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. But the truth is, somebody always gets hurt. And we'll talk more about that next week. See, this idea that, that I want to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want, it, it's not a new idea. As a matter of fact, there's an entire book of the Bible, the book of Judges, it is all about a people group who lived by that mantra. The, 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 this series, we're going to be going through the book of Judges, and it shows us exactly what happens when people do what they want, when they want, and with whom they want. The, bo- the book of Judges, it, it describes this little over 300 years period in Jewish history that's kind of sandwiched between the the Exodus account and the monarchy. It is between these two big events that there was the Exodus where Moses had led the Jewish people out of slavery in Egypt. That's the the crossing of the Red Sea. If you're into movies, it's the Prince of Egypt. It's Charlton Heston in in the Ten Commandments. That story, that's the Exodus. So after that happened, Eventually, the Israelite people, the Jewish people, they make their way to the promised land, the, God, the, the land that God has promised them that, that they can live in. And just before they go in, Moses dies, and a new leader is put in place. His name is Joshua. And Joshua leads the people into the promised land, and they go in, and they settle the land, and they, they do it the way God asks them to, although not perfectly. They, they, they don't do everything exactly the way that they should, but they do overall a pretty good job of settling the land. And so then after that, after they've done what God has commanded them to do, the, pe- the people of Israel, they live kind of like a, like a commonwealth, like, a, like something similar to the original 13 colonies where there's, there's no real central government yet, but yet it's a people group who have common, ancest, common ancestry, they have common language, they have a lot of things in common, but they still function kind of independently as these 12 different tribes. And over those 12 different tribes, there's no king. And the whole point of it was there was not supposed to be a king because they were supposed to view God as their king. See, the way it was supposed to work was that God was the king and that he had given his law that the people were supposed to obey. And then God would occasionally, from time to time, he would raise up judges, hence the name of the book, Judges. He would raise up these judges who would rule, but they wouldn't rule like kings. They didn't have any, like, real solid authority. Really, the only authority they had to do was to distribute the law and to make sure that people followed it. And in a lot of cases, to deliver the people from enemies that had attacked them which actually happens a lot throughout the book of Judges. It's, the book of Judges re- records this pattern that we see over and over and over, where, where the Israelite people, they will kind of rebel against God. They'll make that decision. We want to do what we want, when we want, with whom we want. And so they'll rebel. And because of that, God will allow other groups to come in and to oppress them, that, that they will be, there will be outside nations or outside forces that will come in and kind of take over and oppress the Israelites. And so then they get to a point where they call out to God, and they cry out, and they say, we can't take this anymore. Can you save us? And then God will send a deliverer, usually one of those judges that we talked about, resulting in a time of peace. And that would last for a while until they would rebel, and then a new oppressor would come, and then they'd cry out again, and the whole cycle would start again. And over and over and over, they would rebel, and disaster would come, and then they'd come to God and say, oh, we'll never do it again. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. He sends a deliverer. Does that sound familiar? Even if you're not a Christian, like even if you're, you're not religious, maybe you follow even a different religion, we all have this thing in common. It's this. It's that at some point in your life, you disobeyed something. Maybe it was a religious law that you grew up with. Maybe it was your parents. You disobeyed your parents. Maybe for some of you, it was your conscience. You, you disobeyed your conscience. You knew doing this thing was, wasn't a good idea, wasn't the right thing, but you did it anyway. At some point in your life, 
and you disobeyed something and it got you in a mess and you needed to deliver. You needed somebody to get you out of it. You need somebody to give you a break, somebody to give you a second chance, somebody to bail you out, somebody to take you to rehab, somebody to pay the fine. And you were so thankful when they came that you promised, I will never do that again. I will never make this same mistake again. And you didn't for like a week. And then, and then you were right back to where you started and you did it again. And it created this cycle and it just went on and on and on. See, the reason the book of Judges that we're going to be going through throughout this series, the reason it's so relatable to us is because the story of Israel is them doing the exact same thing. See, this time period was characterized by a saying that shows up at the very end of the book in Judges uh, chapter 21, verse 25. This is what it is. It's that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Basically, everyone did what they wanted, when they wanted, with whom they wanted. And it led to all kinds of chaos and pain and hurt for all the people of Israel. But despite all that pain and struggle, the book of Judges actually it, it, it begins on a really high note. It, it's like it begins in a place similar to like the last night of church camp. If you, if you grew up in church and maybe you went to church camp and you were a little kid, you have, you, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. But if you didn't, let me kind of clue you in. You go to church camp and on the last night of church camp, everybody cries and they all make these decisions. They, they, they're going to, you know, they, they've had this incredible week learning about God and having the word preached to them and, and really building into some incredible relationships and on the last night everybody starts crying and, and you make these commitments like I'm going to do all these things I, I'm going to break up with this person or, or I'm going to stop doing this thing or I'm going to patch things up with this broken relationship and and then you decide basically I'm going to quit everything I'm, I'm going to quit doing all these these terrible things and I joke about that but it's actually if you've ever experienced that, it's actually a really good and a really powerful time when, when a lot of times students or kids begin to prioritize what God wants for them over the things that they want for themselves. And so that's kind of the experience that Israel has as the book of Judges. Jod- Judges opens, is that Joshua, at the very end of what we call the book of Joshua, Joshua is about to die, and he gathers up all the people to give him this big speech. It's kind of his, his farewell address slash pep talk slash like last minute, please be careful before he's going to pass away. And so this is, this is what he says. It's in Joshua 24, beginning in verse 14. He says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away your gods. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. That, that throw away your gods, that's basically code for like break up with him or, or get rid of your cigarettes or, or quit watching porn. Like get rid of all of the stuff that has been pulling you away from God. And so Joshua gives this long exhortation to the people, and this is how they respond in verse 16. It says, Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Basically, they're saying, Don't worry, Joshua. When you're gone, we'll remain faithful. We we won't mess up. We got it. They go on, and they say this in verse 17. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He, protect, he protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. They basically said, hey, Joshua, we made a decision and it's for real this time. God is the Lord. His word is the law. You don't have to worry about us. We remember the stories that our grandparents told us about what it was like living in slavery in Egypt, and we don't ever want to go back to that. And Joshua, if you read this story in its entirety, Joshua kind of begins to pick back at them a little bit, basically saying like, yeah, I hear you, but I bet you will. I bet you will go back. You you don't think you're going to go back. You think this is going to be easy and that you've learned your lesson this time, but it's not going to be as easy as you think it is. And the people respond to him one more time in verse 21. It says, but the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. 
We promise this time, Joshua. We, we promise we won't, we won't stop following God. And Joshua, Joshua basically says back to him, okay, well, I warned you. And then he dies. And, and lo and behold, what happens almost immediately? Judges chapter 2, verse 11. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They had barely changed their clothes after Joshua's funeral. And the next thing they know, they are doing exactly the thing that Joshua had warned them not to do and the thing that they promised they would never do again. They got home from church camp. They got back from rehab. They got back from church. They got back from the mission trip. They got back from the hospital. And they went right back to doing all the things that they had been doing before. Verse 12, they forsook the Lord the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They started looking around at the surrounding cultures and saying, ooh, that looks okay. Oh, that, that looks interesting. Everybody else is doing this. Everybody else is doing this, so we don't want to be the oddballs here. We don't want to be the, the strange people in Canaan. We don't want to be that different. I, I mean, we're glad... That, that God has done so much for us in the past, and so we want to say that we're faithful to him still. But we kind of like the things that these other cultures are offering. We like the things that, that they say that their gods can offer to us. And the next thing you know, they had abandoned God. They had abandoned God as, the, as their king. They had abandoned his law, and they just completely immersed themselves in the culture of the Canaanites, right after Joshua had warned them not to, right after they had sworn they would never do that again. Verse 13, the end of verse 12 and verse 13, they aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. The, the, that, those two names there, Baal and Asherah, those are two different gods that the Canaanites worship. They're kind of counter, counterpart gods. They're like one's male and one's female. And the problem with worshiping those gods was threefold. Number one, um, God had told them no idol worship. Like, that We do not worship, uh, you know, as the people of God, you do not worship other gods. They're not supposed to worship any representation of a god. And Baal and Asherah were, Asherah were both gods that, that had these little idols that people would pray to, the statues and, and, and things like that. And so that was not something that Israel was supposed to do at all. But beyond that, the even bigger problem was all of the other things that went along with worshiping Baal and Asherah. See, these were not just male and female deities. These were fertility gods. And, and worship to them included some like ritual sex acts that were designed to entice those two gods into doing the same thing, which in turn would supposedly bring rain on the land and, and produce fertile crops for the people. But even beyond that, if things were going bad for the people, maybe there was a drought or there was a famine to really try and get the gods' attention, they would offer human sacrifices. And if things were really, really bad, they would offer child sacrifices. And obviously, this was something that, that God wanted his people to have no part of at all. And so when they engaged in this, this is how it, he responded. Verse 14, in his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. God basically said to the Israelites, said, okay, you like the Canaanites. How about I let you be conquered by the very people you copy? And they were. They, they were conquered by the very culture that they copied. God basically said to him, look, you, you worship them freely. You abandon me freely. But when you do that, you, you've lost. You've lost your freedom. See, your ancestors, you remember, they told you all about what it was like to live under the power of a foreign king. But here, you have willingly gave yourself up to the Canaanites. If you like it so much, fine. Have it your way. And they turned their backs on God. 
and they copied the culture around them, and they surrendered their freedom. See, this is the thing in life that always sneaks up on us over and over and over. It's the thing that, that we never see coming until it's too late. It's the thing that, just like the Israelites had experienced over and over in Judges, it's the thing that pulls us back into that cycle of, I want to do what I want to do until, uh-oh, I'm doing what I want to do, and I don't like it. And worse than that, I can't quit. See, here's the reality is that Israel had simply traded one king for another. They, they were no longer able to resist. They, they walked away from God, and they found themselves in a place where they could not freely go back. And there is a huge lesson in this for all of us. We all have our own story that is probably eerily similar to this. Whether you grew up in church and, and you heard all the Bible verses, you heard all the stuff, you knew the Ten Commandments, you knew right from wrong, and, and maybe even your, your conscience had been shaped by some scripture verses that you had memorized at some point. You had this, this basic clarity of how to know right from wrong, and you promised at some point to never walk away from it. And then at some point, you said, I want to do what I want to do. I'm tired of being good, tired of being a church person. I'm just tired of this, all of this. Or maybe for you, it was a little bit more gradual. And there was no like clear decision point where you just said, I'm done. But just gradually, over time, you very slowly got there anyways. Or maybe for some of you, you weren't even a Christian. But you knew, you had an idea of what right and wrong is and maybe you tuned into just like basic American or religious values, but somewhere along the way, even you said, I want to do what I want to do, and I want to live my own life. I don't want anyone telling me what to do. I don't need a king. I certainly don't need an invisible God who never seems to be on my side anyway. And then one day you woke up and you realized, I didn't gain any freedom. My seeking freedom actually ended up in a loss of freedom. Because Here's the truth, is that each of us, all of us, you and I, we were created, which means there's a creator. You were created, which means there's a creator, which means that you were created to be ruled over. And because you were created to be ruled over, that means that when you reject one king, you just trade it in for another thing that will eventually rule over you. I'll give you some examples. Um, uh, th we, we, in our culture, in our day and age, we tend to give in to things like, maybe it's not a foreign god, like worshiping an actual another deity, but we give ourselves over to other kings, uh, substitute kings, things like our appetites. And that's not just a food thing. I'm just talking about, like, in general, when we want stuff. Like you desired to have something and you went to it and maybe you went to it over and over and over and it satisfied less and less and less. And then a little bit way down the road, you find yourself in a situation where you can't say no and you're spending money left and right or, or you're, you're caught up in, a, in a, an addiction or, or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden you're ruled. Maybe it's not an appetite. Maybe for you it's, it's insecurity or, or fear or, or comparison with other people or, or lust. We could talk about that one for a while. Or, or maybe, maybe it's greed. For some of you, it's, it's family history. See, some of you, your number one goal in life, whether you said it out loud or not, your number one goal was, I will not be like my dad or I will not be like my mom, or, or my family will not be like my family. History will not repeat itself. And then at some point, you abandon God. And when that happens, I promise you, you can mark it down. Your family history will repeat itself. You were made to be ruled, not controlled. That's something different. 
But because you were made to be ruled, your best bet for breaking the pattern of family history is not doing what you want, when you want, with whom you want. Matter of fact, that's probably how your family history that you want to get away from is probably how that started, was that at some point, somebody, your parents, your grandparents, whoever it was, they did what they wanted, when they wanted, with whom they wanted. And now it has created a cycle in your family that you haven't been able to break free from. See, whatever it is, all of these substitute kings, they all tempt us with the same idea. It's that those words, I won't. I won't be controlled. I I won't obey until one day you wake up finding finding yourself saying, "I, I can't. I can't stop. I can't get away. I can't go back. I can't back out. I can't change. And eventually you find yourself asking this question, why is it? that it's always easier to say no to God than it is to say no to the things we substitute for God. Why is it so much easier to say, look, I know this person, I know he or she, I know they're not good for me, I know that I have no business moving in, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Why is it so much easier to say no to God, but now that you're in it, it's so much harder to walk away. Now that you're in a situation that you want out of, why is it so much harder to say no to the substitute than it was to say no to God in the first place? Here's why. The reason you get to that place after the substitute kings promised you freedom, the reason you get there is this. Those kings are not merciful. Those kings don't love you, and those kings will control you. They do not have your best interests at heart. They promise freedom, but ultimately, they take it away. See, if there's one thing for you to remember today, it's this. This is the bottom line, is that maximum freedom is found under the authority of God. Maximum freedom is found under the authority of God every single time. It is never found under the control of substitute kings. Maximum freedom in this life is found under the authority of God because he's the only king who gives you the freedom to walk away. That's what real love does. Love doesn't force itself on an unwilling participant. There's no bait and switch in real love. There's no trapping you in a place where you can't say no. And... When you recognize that, that maximum freedom is found under the authority of God, when you recognize who he is and what he offers, when you come to that place and you want to turn back to him, he will take you back every time. I mentioned that cycle earlier that we see over and over in in Judges where they reject God and then he allows them to be oppressed And and as we reach the the point in the book where you see this happen for the first time, the first example of this, here's what's happened. In Judges chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it says, The Israelites did evil in in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of, oh my goodness, here we go, Cushan Rishathaim. King of Aram, Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. God said, fine, you like Canaanite ways, you can have a Canaanite king. And they suffered under a king whose culture they had adopted for eight long years. But at the end of those eight years, you know what they did? They did what some of you are ready to do. They did what some of you really need to do. They threw up their hands and they said, Oh God, we have sinned. Oh God, we we were fooled. We thought that this would go this way, but it's actually resulted in a loss of freedom. Oh God, would you deliver us? And God says, Yes. Because you're still my people. And you see it over and over in Judges. He sends a deliverer to save the people. He sent a deliverer for us. He sent a deliverer to rescue us from sin. To rescue you from the freedom that you gave over to the substitute king. See, one of the greatest things about following Jesus is that he is a God of rescue. That he is a God of grace and mercy. 
It's grace because he gave himself for you on the cross, which you did not deserve. But he is also merciful and that he will not force his way on you because maximum freedom is found under the authority of God. God doesn't want to control you. God loves you. And he wants you to love him back. Something that, that those substitute kings, they have no understanding of. See, the only way to have a love relationship with God is for you to have the freedom to go when you want to go. And for him to have the mercy to receive you when you want to come back, even if it's over and over and over. But you don't want that. You don't want to be the over and the over and the over person. Not because God's eventually going to say, enough with you, I'm done. Not because of that. The reason you don't want to be that person is because you can't get those years back. You can't get your 20s back. And you can't get your 30s back. You can't reparent your children. You can't have another first marriage. You can't show up for the things that you needed to show up for. You can't go back and do that again. And once those years are gone, they're gone. Wasted, serving substitute kings who do not care for you or your future. Maximum freedom is found only under the authority of God. Because the truth is this, is that when we strive to do what we want, when we want, with whom we want, we simply trade one king for another. How much better for us, rather than hearing God say to us, have it your way, for us to say back to him, have it your way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for your love and your grace. God, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us that that despite all of the times that we have turned our backs on you, you continue to be faithful and loving and to offer relationship with us. Father, help us to help us to recognize the freedom that is found only in you. That the freedom found anywhere else in the world is just an illusion. That eventually we're going to find ourselves serving someone else or something else in a way that steals our freedom. But in you, we actually have true freedom. Father, thank you for loving us in that way. Help us to turn to you. We love you. Amen. stand and sing one more as we go this morning. Hide me now under
find rest, my soul. In Christ alone, know His power. In quietness and trust. So when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood, and I will be still to know you are God. I will be still to know you are God, and I will be still to know you are few things in, in way of announcements. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, uh, Kaylin again for, for sharing your baptism with us this morning. Um, it's all pretty awesome. Uh, uh, Tyler, again, thanks for sharing your morning with us this morning and, and giving us information on World Compassion and the Family to Family uh, Baskets. We appreciate you. Uh, starting point is today, right after church. If you want to know more about our church beliefs and how to become a member of our church, please join us uh, at 1130 in classroom number two. Uh, we've got lunch and child care will be provided as well. Um, the Salt and Light group that meets on Thursday mornings from 9 to 11 are starting a new study on the tongue. It's called Conversation Peace. We welcome all women to attend. It begins Thursday, April 11th. You can reach out to Susan Douglas uh, for more information. We are picking up the chairs today, so if you stack your row and uh, move it off to the side, we'd be uh, greatly appreciated. And also, uh, we want to lift up Ray, uh, Ray Beam's brother, who's down in um, in the hospital in Nashville with some uh, complications with 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 blood clots, and uh, we just want to lift lift Randy up today. Uh, let us pray. Father, we love you. Father, we pray that um, that you assist the doctors in finding a way to to um, to treat uh, Randy and his condition. And Father, we just lift him up uh, to you now. We know that you have the power to heal. We also ask that, um, that you support and position his family in a way um, to support Randy now in his time of need. Father, we ask that, um, that you be with us today and throughout the week until you bring us back together again. We love you. We ask these things in your son's name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.